Hi, it's uh, Sarah Joseph, and welcome to our weekly show where we curate news about tech. This week, we are going to do something special for the very first time. We're going to do a tech deep dive, and this week, it's on the future of death and death tech. I'm just absolutely excited to have uh, Christian Hennebel with me as our first guest, and um, you are kind of an expert on death. Well, yeah, I'm an amateur expert. Let's let's put it that way, because uh, I've always been very fascinated by death, uh, and uh, I've always also been very fascinated by tech. So uh, death tech is uh, indeed a very interesting topic for me. And you actually, so you just had your second child. So I guess you are very confronted with life and death at the same same time, the beginning and the end. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your your amateur work, as you call it, uh, cataloging and understanding death? Yeah, I've always been interested in death, and I've all, and uh, as a result of that, I've been very interested in uh, in cemeteries. Uh, cemeteries are great parks, uh, but it's also filled with uh, a lot of history. So if you're walking around a Danish cemetery, for instance, you'll see uh, monuments from the 18th century and you'll see tombstones from uh, soldiers from World War One, and you'll see uh, average uh, plumbers and uh, everything in between. Uh, so if you're walking around a Danish cemetery, you'll see uh, all kinds of history. And that's the same for cemeteries all over the world. Um, my uh, idea was that it's uh, very quite tricky to find the interesting tombstones. Uh, so together with a friend, we made a, a service called tusensten.dk, which translates to a thousand stones, um, where you can use your smartphone to find the interesting tombstones uh, nearby. Uh, wow. So actually you're, you are digitizing and curating how people can find interesting pieces of history at the cemetery. Precisely. And then they can... Uh, be part of the crowd that they can contribute with interesting facts about uh, some uh, people who are not so well known, but perhaps they have interesting tombstones and you can explain, okay, this is actually my great granddad and he used to be whatever. Uh, and uh, and then they can contribute with stories about their lives. Wow. But uh, today death is, um, it's not an analog experience as we may have been used to. Also the Uh, death industry is growing quite significantly, um, unfortunately, as a result of COVID-19. And Christian has helped us curate some stories, uh, both about the future of technology and how we curate death, what we do with the human body, um, what will happen to our digital assets. And the first story that you brought with with you is um, from Forbes uh, about the future of death. Um, And I want to read a small quote from the story. The death of a friend or a family member can be one of the most traumatizing experience of one's life. In recent months, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, many people have come to realize the importance of coming together emotionally while staying physically apart. This has led to the death tech startups, introducing technologies that allow mourners to deal with death in new compassionate, and even more environmentally sustainable ways. What are some of these new startups and ideas that have emerged from the pandemic period? Well, first of all, I think it's really interesting that most of us know of health tech and fintech and food tech, perhaps. But death tech is uh, is something quite new. Um, and, uh, and they're building a lot of new business models. For instance, there's a service called Good Trust, uh, which aims to preserve our digital lives after we die. Um, I think that's quite a funny uh, funny business model because a lot of debate has been about whether we could actually remove ourselves, mm. um, remove our social profiles after we die. And this one's actually trying to do the opposite, trying to preserve mm. the digital memories, the digital life that we've had so far after we die. Uh, and that is a, that's a very nice uh, way of uh, making us uh, Live not forever, but uh, that our digital lives should uh, should uh, keep uh, keep on going after we die. Yeah, and uh, wh- so I, of course, w- when you introduced me to the service, I went ahead and, and signed up. And um, first of all, there are two packages. There's the free package and one that's five ninety nine a month. And <laughs> since I'm thirty five, I don't plan on dying soon, no. so so I picked the the free package. Um, but I was very um, interested in the idea that uh, instead of leaving your virtual reputation to someone else, that you have the power to curate your own story. Yeah. What is the last story I will tell my family? What is my last tweet? 
what are the messages or images or stories I want to keep once they do close my Facebook profile. Yeah. So I think it it um, gives me a sense of empowerment that I am in control of some of the things that happen afterwards. And I think that's actually a very important word, empowerment, because I think that's uh, what's really driving this death tech uh, trend that we need to, that we want to be in charge of our own deaths and our own afterlife. We don't want to just leave it to our families. We want to plan it ahead. We want to plan our digital uh, life after we die. We want to plan the way that we're going to get, to be buried. We want to plan uh, where we're going to get buried. Uh, so this empowerment idea is, uh, is, is very important to mm. understanding uh, death tech, I think. And then I think one of the startups uh, from the story as well deal with something about what happens to your body. Yeah. Could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, because uh, apparently, I didn't know this to be honest, uh, but uh, apparently some people think that it's uh, quite bad for the environment to be buried in a regular casket. Mm-hmm. Both you need the wood to make the casket yeah. and you need to have it processed and, and it's... Uh, not necessarily that good for the environment. Uh, so some people in, in the US came up with this idea that you could be buried in in a burial suit, basically, mm. which is uh, biodegradable. And uh, Luke Perry, the star of uh, Beverly Hills 90210, um, was buried in one of those. Wow. Um, and uh, and I guess the idea is that uh, the body will decompose mm. uh, quicker and a better way, more efficient way, uh, in order to, for you to be... Uh, to become nutrients for mm. for the nature and um, yeah uh, what one of the things i noticed during my research phase too was that the, there's quite a lot of innovation happening around caskets yeah uh, and you're right because uh, the process of decomposition is, is quite bad for the environment yeah. so i saw for example there is a startup that does um, caskets made out of willow which mm. apparently is more sustainable and then there are several websites that allow you to curate and custom make and order your own casket that's made out of a series of different of more um, uh, sustainable alternatives. So definitely a big uh, industry um, and some new, you know, you know, changes and um, and technology is giving us new options about what happens once we die. Precisely. But also, so you're fascinated with uh, with cemeteries, particularly tombstones, but. Um, the future of cemeteries is also a place where we're seeing a lot of innovation and where technology and the artistic expression is changing. Um, you curated a story for us called The Future of Cemeteries. Death is a high-tech trip in Japan's futuristic cemetery. The story is from Vice. And again, I want to share a little bit from the story. Yomiku Nakamija, a woman in her 70s, is selecting her grave. But instead of choosing a hunk of a stone in a regular outdoor cemetery, she has her eyes set on a glowing blue glass Buddha. Uh, she has chosen Buddha, a Buddha statue, um, and on all sides, it's surrounded by a collection of 2,045 LED lit statues um, spaced across the walls in this alternative graveyard space. And it's, it's hard for me to describe when you haven't seen it. It will link to the article. It looks a, it looks like a nightclub or a, <laughs> like a lighting museum. Yeah. Um, and just to finish, each statue, which is placed on the wall inside a transparent glass casing, either already represents a deceased person or will do so in the future. Uh, so she has picked this very alternative site. What is happening with the, with the, the future of cemeteries? Well, I think this is uh, what a cemetery would look like in Blade Runner. And uh, yeah. <laughs> we're already seeing it, it, it now, yeah, yeah. actually. And um, I think it's uh, because these mega cities that we see evolve uh, around the world, um, they don't have enough space mm-hmm. for, well, leaving a lot of dead people around and some very precious um, uh, real estate. Uh, so, uh, so instead of having people buried in the ground, they make a, a more efficient way of uh, stacking them and making it a lot smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so in a city like Tokyo, you could have uh, hundreds of thousands buried in a more efficient way and in a more personal way mm-hmm. that you could choose uh, another way of uh, having a place where you can go and think about your loved ones. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be a tombstone that it could be this uh, mm. more high tech environment and protected from the uh, from rain and snow and whatever mm. and then uh, you can uh, choose it in a different way 
And again, she's uh, choosing her own plot. Yep. She's choosing the way that she wants to be represented in her afterlife. Yeah, so it seems like there's a big empowerment trend in you picking what will happen, what will it look like, what will happen to my body, and what's the legacy that comes after. But I see some some interesting trends in this as well. Yeah. One you mentioned is this uh, cost efficiency yeah. and space efficiency. Yeah. So what we learned from the article is that typically a family will spend between twenty thousand and forty thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So so that. Uh, I think in Denmark you you almost take away zero. Yeah. So so that was pretty mind blowing. So there is um there's a cost perspective, yeah. there's a space perspective. It almost is like when you're in a hotel in Tokyo. Yeah. Like they stack those people into like yeah. the beds that's like a hotel and you just like unlock your bed and go in and it's like one tiny space. They're yeah. doing the same with the bodies. Yeah. But then there's also the perspective of the the visual, the aesthetics. Yeah. I know that when my uh, when my grandmother passed, we actually all uh, quite disagreed on a lot of stuff in the family. Yeah. Um, even from what kind of casket, what kind of flower arrangement, what kind of coloring, but certainly also the stone that came after and actually also the um, the notice in the newspaper. Yeah. So here they are picking what uh, expression do I want to be in a continuation of me? And then finally the maintenance for the family left behind. Yeah. Here you don't have to go with fresh flowers all the time. I mean, you can, but it's not this whole you know garden arrangement. No, and uh, and I think it uh, we see it in the high tech version here in uh, in Tokyo, but uh, in Denmark even you would still see people who are planning way more ahead and planning their b- precise burial mm-hmm. spot. Here, you're just being aided by technology by doing it in a more efficient manner and a more uh, uh, personalized manner, so you can really choose the way that you are going to spend your afterlife. Do you know to what extent uh, that we hear in Denmark that people go on this anonymous burial site? Because that's quite a contrast to what we're talking about here. Yeah, uh, there's been a sharp increase in people being uh, not uh, so much at an uh, anonymous burial site, but at a being buried at sea, um, mm-hmm. where your ashes are being spread uh, across the sea, what? or you're being buried in a forest, mm-hmm. which is a quite a new invention as well, um, which leaves a lot of room in the Danish cemeteries. Mm. Uh, so in contrast to what's going on in Tokyo or Rio de Janeiro or other big cities, uh, there's actually a lot of room in Danish cemeteries because uh, there are not that many people being buried um, anymore. Uh, they're choosing different ways. Uh, mm. But again, they're of their own choosing uh, that I want to be buried at sea or I want to be buried in the in the forest. Um, so we don't see uh, that many anonymous graves, but they're mm. just being spread mm. across the landscape instead. And what is a um, kind of the the composition of the of the cemetery in terms of different religions? How yeah. do we handle that in Denmark? Uh, well, uh, in Denmark we have uh, we have a big uh, Muslim cemetery. We have uh, we have uh, a few uh, Jewish cemeteries. Uh, we have some Catholic cemeteries, but mm. otherwise, uh, other than that, they're basically mixed together. Mm. So you could uh, walk around a, a regular cemetery and you'll see Christians and Muslims and Jews uh, and uh, Sinto and Hindus uh, lying side by side, basically. Mm. Uh, but since the uh, composition of the Danish uh, public has changed quite rapidly since uh, over the last 50 years, there's been a need now for having uh, a separate Muslim cemetery, mm. uh, which was built I guess ten years ago or something okay. like that. Um, um, but uh, but other than that, you'll see a, a quite huge mm. variety, and you'll see Chinese signs, and you'll wow. see uh, uh, two circles where you can see okay, this guy was bo- born in Lima and died here mm. in, in uh, Copenhagen, for instance. Which is part of globalization that you can see that uh, that this would not ha- have happened uh, eighty years ago, for yeah. instance. So you know when people pass. Um, we have a procedure of how we handle it in Denmark. And I remember when my father passed away a year and a half ago, uh, they called me um, and they said, can we do an autopsy? And I said, sure, uh, why not, right? Because when people pass away and they're by themselves, they often tend to do, uh, especially if they're younger, to make sure there was no foul play involved. And then they said, but he's a Muslim. And I said, oh, yeah, I totally actually have forgotten that he was a Muslim. You know, is it still acceptable? So as a person left behind, because he didn't, he had not set up this yeah. uh, good trust or yeah. Yeah, account that he didn't and probably didn't anticipate uh, to die, you know, before he turned 60. Um, 
So he didn't have these procedures in place. And he actually left me in a very uncomfortable position, yeah. having to make choices for a person I hadn't spoken to in 25 years. Yeah. So it was a very strange situation because he didn't leave anything behind. And I know that um, he's buried somewhere in Aarhus. I have never been there. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's uh, you know, in the regular cemetery yeah. between regular people. And I just got a, a message from the government in my email inbox saying he's burial, buried in this and this site. Okay. So that was a very also a highly digitized, semi-absurd experience. Yeah. Uh, but I have actually never gone. Maybe one day we'll go together. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We'll, <laughs> we'll then go we'll find it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's just um, I, I'm doing some thinking about what uh, what I want to happen when I die and what I want it to look like. Um, I certainly am more attracted to some of this uh, this hype, this light, this whole uh, ambiance that we yeah. see uh, in Tokyo. But um, actually, how we choose to be buried has real consequences, not just for us uh, and for you know our bills, but also for the environment. So. Um, According to uh, industry t- statistics provided by the Cremation Association of North America in uh, 2017, about 55% of our bodies were cremated instead of buried. Uh, and to me, I've actually always thought I want to be cremated because I feel like putting a body, the whole body in the earth is a little bit creepy to me. Hmm. The idea of like uh, the decomposition and worms and I don't like that. So I always thought I wanted to be cremated. But then I read this. And the number of people choosing cremation over burial is predicted to increase to 71% over the next 10 years. But these differences in burial um, rituals actually have a real effect on the environment. Discover Magazine uh, have written about this on their website and also in the September issue of the magazine. And they write, imagine a world where when a person dies, they took all their riches with them like the pharaohs of Egypt. If you consider biological material to be of value, this is not so far removed from our modern reality. Except that instead of gold and silver treasure being buried with us, it is our nutrients. These riches we hoard in our graves are the mineral building blocks necessary for those still alive. The carbon in our skin, the iron in our blood, and the calcium in our bones. These nutrients exist as finite, limited resources in the world. But conventional practices of embalming and cremation prevent their recycling, hindering our ability to give back that which have been attained from other living things. Yeah, yeah, and um, and cremation has been uh, on the rise for a hundred years or so, I think. Um, and personally, I, I, w- I want to be buried. Uh, I, I want to be a pretty skeleton uh, at, one, yeah. at one time. Uh, and I want my body to be consumed by the earth. Um, and it just feels more natural mm-hmm. to me. Uh, but I know that cremation has been on the rise, both because of, uh, you, you, again, you want to save space. And mm-hmm. uh, an urn uh, keeps a lot more less space than a, than a casket. Uh, so you could uh, you could do it in a more efficient way. But uh, as long as I have the, the opportunity, then I, I definitely mm-hmm. want to be buried myself. Um, but I think, uh, I think the industry... Because this is a big industry. So yeah. the people who sell caskets, I think they should be telling, this is the modern story. This is the yeah. story that the millennial will respond to. I have not thought about what the world has given to me in yeah. a very bodily sense. Yeah. And that I actually have an obligation to give that back for yeah. the future generations. I find that incredibly thought-provoking and also inspiring. It, it actually makes me reconsider what I want to do. Yeah, and uh, and uh, as again I mentioned that someone's uh, choosing to be buried in in a forest, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's really because they want to deliver nutrients to the trees, and uh, to a lot of people, to, and I guess to a lot of millennials, I guess it would make a lot of sense to uh, make your body decompose and become part of an orchard or mm-hmm. or a plant or whatever uh, that you could uh, could give life, uh, make your life continue as a mm-hmm. plant. Um, so when all these tech giants are obsessed with eternal life, they're kind of viewing it from the wrong perspective. At least uh, to some people, yeah. I yeah. Think so. yeah, yeah, because parts of you could be passed on, just like when we have children, we are yeah. passing on a part of who we are. Yeah. You know, we are also by allowing our body to decompose, yeah. actually providing the next generation. Yeah, we are the seeds from the fruit, yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah, and we're altering that with some of our tech. So yeah. that's that's super interesting. So yeah. once you do, you know, you have passed. You leave behind other people, 
And generally, they're upset about it. Yeah. It depends if you're not a very Hopefully. nice person. Hopefully, yeah, Hopefully they're upset. Maybe they're not yeah. super upset. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, this obviously has some ripple effects. And death is also a hugely popular topic in fiction. Yeah. And Definitely. we all know, those of us who build tech, we get all our best ideas from fiction. <laughs> yeah. So you don't underestimate yeah. this uh, this genre for inspiration. And you brought one of my absolute favorite TV shows with you, um, Black Mirror and uh, the episode Be Right Back. Could you tell uh, our lovely audience who may or may not have uh, seen this episode before, what is it all about? Yeah, first of all, just a mini introduction to Black Mirror for you, those of you who haven't seen it. Black Mirror is about... Uh, the use of technology and how it's going to affect our lives and our deaths. Uh, and it's normally set just a few years uh, ahead of time from, from now. Uh, so it's not uh, really science fiction. We're not talking uh, uh, flying cars. We're talking about just uh, amplifying the trends that we see currently just to, uh, a few more uh, years ahead. And in this episode, we follow a woman who's lost her husband. Um, and uh, she really, she's mourning, she really misses him. And uh, she finds a way of, um, of purchasing a chatbot that um, emulates his, uh, him, uh, his, uh, her boyfriend. Um, and uh, it's very, very lifelike. It, uh, it builds on all his uh, previous uh, social media posts, his uh, tweets, his pictures. Uh, so the chatbot can really uh, emulate him really, really well. Um, then she is, uh, there's a premium uh, version where she can uh, get text messages and she can get voice. And uh, later on, she'll, uh, she can get a, a robot uh, that uh, looks precisely like him. Uh, so she is able to get her husband back in a, in a sort of way. Uh, and I think that's a, a really fascinating way because we all leave this digital pr- footprint uh, that we mentioned with a good mm-hmm. trust, um, but someone can build something out of that. Yeah. Um, and it, it's incredibly interesting and thought-provoking for several different reasons. Yeah. Um, just like you said, it, it ties a knot to the other stories because with technology today, especially with uh, machine learning and natural language processing, we can actually convert those messages or emails or social media footprint into something tangible like a chatbot and there is something about the story because we might think it's fiction but it's not entirely fiction can no. you say a little bit about that yeah actually the, there was a, a woman who lost her who lost her husband and she built um, a, a chatbot uh, based on all the messages that her uh, that her boyfriend left behind uh, and that really worked it, it, it worked in it, it, she the chatbot kept the same language; it used the same idioms, uh, and so so it's not that uh, it's not a stretch. Of course, the, no one has made a robot uh, that's lifelike enough uh, yet, but uh, but certainly the the trends are there, and I'm sure that someone will try uh, to um, to emulate one of their lost ones. Um, because why wouldn't you? If you have all this uh, footprint, and you can. Uh, and you're mourning and you really need to find uh, find your loved one again, uh, then I'm sure that someone will come up with a business model and the technology to uh, to do this. Yeah. And this has become a bit of an urban legend, this yeah. whole story, because there is some truth to it. Here, um, we actually, here at Canopy Lab, we deep dived into the story about a year and a half ago. And it's because we have this concept called AI Friday that we run about once a month or every other month where uh, we tell all of our uh, employees to bring a story uh, with the use of artificial intelligence, uh, but it cannot be related to Canopy Lab and to educational tech as such. And then they tell the story of like, what is this tech and why did I find it interesting? And someone brought in the story oh. along with like one of all the, all, a bunch of other really cool stories. They told the story just like you told the story. And then we said, okay, what about this story do we like and what do we not like about it, right? So we said, okay, there are several things that make us feel uncomfortable that are relevant to the story also just in general. Yeah. There's a lack of consent, mm-hmm. or at least we don't know no. if consent has been given. If he uses this good trust to yeah. say, please create a, yeah. an, an avatar of yeah. me yeah. <laughs> with all my social media posts. Um, so we said the lack of consent it concerned us a little bit. The lack of it being a p- private person concerns us a little bit as yeah. well. 
Uh, and then we said, okay, well, how might we alter this? Yeah. And we said, what if the person had given consent? Yeah. Then we feel more comfortable yeah. about it. And then we said, what if it was a historical person? That we remove it a little bit, like if a person who had deceased yeah. some time ago. Yeah. And then we said, what even if it was a person who had donated their writings or journals mm. to a library already? Yeah. Then that makes us feel better. And then we said, who might that person be? Yeah. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, that would be right. Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what if you make this chatbot personalized about Abraham Lincoln and then students could chat with him, you know, depending on their different levels and it would draw on open source historical resources. Yeah. That made us feel comfortable. And then we said, what if we had to build it in Canopy Lab? Yeah. And then we actually built on that. We, we built uh, our own uh, neural network. We built our own chatbots. We fed them with knowledge about how to create amazing courses. One of them is built on me, and one is <laughs> built on our chief learning officer, Lisa, okay, that nice. you can chat with. Yeah. But of course, we haven't taken it to the same extreme, but we are actually constantly pushing yeah. the advancement of the AI. So not only it mirrors our speech patterns, but also it contains knowledge, and also it begins to extrapolate. So for example, in this case, if her husband and her used to go to Tivoli Gardens and eat ice cream every Sunday, and yeah. she said, remember that, Friday last year, we went to Tivoli and we had an ice cream. Then it would either uh, source the catalog and it, it finds a social media post where they had a chocolate ice cream. Yeah. And then next time she says, oh, remember the year before when we went there? Maybe there is no information about that time, but statistically he knows that every other yeah. time they had a chocolate ice cream. So it will attempt to, yeah, to yeah. create yeah. a reality based on that. And that's a part of how we're pushing our chatbots now. We're also training the chatbots to take all of the courses so they can talk to you about. So actually, we're going to do a course on the future of death and the future of death technology that you can go on to student.canopylab.com and take. And there, we're also training the chatbots to take the courses. So you might say, wait, what was that point about why, you know, if you want to help the earth, you shouldn't be cremated, but you should actually let your body decompose. Why was that important again? And then the chatbot can tell you, ah, it was important because X, Y, Z. So, um, you know, don't underestimate the power of fiction in shaping our future and in shaping reality because fiction often is a great source of inspiration and we know many entrepreneurs love science fiction as a genre. Oh yeah. Um, the obsession with life after death and the obsession with uh, continuing your own life. Yeah. So not just your digital life and the preservation of that, but actually preserving life maybe in your own body. Also, if you watch Altered Carbon, you just take a new yeah. body. But... but um, there tend to be a thing about these uh, these uh, tech millionaires and billionaires, yeah. usually usually men, yeah, usually a little older. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They want to live forever. I'm talking about like Larry Ellison, who spent most of his fortune on uh, medical research, yep. and then Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk, maybe the new new Ray Kurzweil. So yeah. we know that Ray and the, the Singularity community have been obsessed with the idea of uploading the brain to the cloud uh, for a very long time. We also have seen several yeah. scientists. Prove and disprove whether it's possible, leaving the rest of us slightly confused yeah. about whether it will one day be possible or not. Several articles you know, that I saw in my research say, this is why it's not possible and this is why it will never be possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, I think we have to be careful with the word never. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like lots yeah. has changed. Yeah. But one tangible thing we can talk about now is Neuralink yeah. and Elon Musk. Uh, I've brought two different articles. Um, one... Um, is from Business Insider, uh, and um, it's uh, called Neuralink is not the first uh, scientist monkey uh, to control a computer with its mind. And the second article uh, is called A Monkey Implanted with Elon Musk's Neuralink Now Plays Ping Pong Really Well Using His uh, using his Mind. Once again, Musk makes the impossible possible, and that's why we find him so fascinating. Yeah. So if we look at a couple of the different points, I think there's a general sense of you know, consensus that for at least 20 years, we have been able to put so implant chips in monkeys' brains yeah. and have them do stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> More advanced stuff than yeah. they wouldn't. Yes. Than that. Yeah. What's interesting to you about this whole thing? What are you worried about? Like, Why, uh, well, why, we, why did we bring this story? There are so many interesting aspects. Um, I, I, one of the things I love with, with the Elon Musk is that uh, at one point said that, um, that he believed that there was a 50-50 chance that we were actually living in a computer simulation, mm-hmm. uh, like the Matrix. Um, so, so even this guy who believes that you could flip a coin and it might be that you're actually living in a computer simulation, he's still maybe in this computer simulation planning on mm-hmm. his afterlife, yeah. planning <laughs> yeah. on 
on uh, on living forever in this computer simulation that he might be living in. Uh, but he has the uh, the vision and the basic and the money uh, to try to do a lot of things uh, and try to uh, alter the way that we live our lives and the way that we die. Mm. Um, so this way of uh, altering both uh, monkey br- monkeys' brains and the way that we are going to uh, to to use our brains in this life and beyond uh, is is definitely in the scope of, of Elon Musk. Mm. So it seems like to me there are two different perspectives. One is the immediate research implications for people with diseases somehow related to the brain, yeah. right? So I think there is a great potential for the quadriplegic community, uh, Alzheimer's, all kinds of diseases as we continue to study the brain, have ability to alter the brain and ability to increase communication for people who are somehow less capable of communicating. Yeah. But the question is if the long time long-term play here isn't about eternal life in some capacity. I guess if um, the brain is still basically the last mystery of uh, of our bodies uh, that we don't really quite understand how it works. What What is the mind? What is the soul? Uh, what is the experience? Could you could you separate this from our bodies yes. and, and upload it to the body? Uh, and if the more we know about the brain, the more likely is it that we could do this, and the more likely is it that you could manipulate our our, our minds, our brains, uh, in order to cure diseases as well, mm. such as Alzheimer's or mm. dementia or uh, or other other diseases. Um, because then you would know how to alter the code, so to speak. Uh, and perhaps you could take someone who is severely paralyzed mm. and uh, and separate the. Um, the mind to something else and remove that uh, mm. faulty code, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, we don't know, but uh, I'm sure it's uh, something that they're going to pursue. Mm. Um, I think for a long time, we as humans have tried to make humans more perfect. Yeah. Um, I know for a long time, we have tried to eliminate you know, imperfect humans to be born into the world. Mm. I know that with our second child, Atlas, we were tested in the risk of uh, Down syndrome. And in Denmark, it's generally a very acceptable and predominant view that if a child has Down syndrome, it should just not be born. Um, I've been quite surprised because this is the reality that we grow up in. Mm. I've been quite surprised now that my community of friends in other countries is growing, how that is totally not the opinion in the United States and in South America and having had you know, have friends that have now had children with Down syndrome. Um, I do have some concerns about how we're constantly, you know, I understand when you have diseases that we want to help people have a better life. Mm. But I also talked to my five-year-old, uh, Elliot, whom I had problems explaining the concept of having a handicap the other day because he's never seen a person with a handicap. No. Yeah. So, so tech is used to alter yeah. as we live as much as alter when we die. And then I think in terms of you don't have to be a huge narcissist to love the idea of your thoughts yeah. and memories living forever. It, but I am particularly interested in, in what you mentioned about the relationship between the mind and the body mm. and how much our reality and our opinion is shaped by our body. Yeah. Um, I think, I think basically <clears throat> we want to, uh, we want to have as much of us live forever. Most people, mm. a lot of people, uh, and we know that our bodies are deteriorating by the minute. Um, um, but the idea that our minds could live forever in the cloud um, or perhaps be uploaded to another body as mm. they see in altered carbon mm. um, is, of course, fascinating to many. Because if you could have eternal youth, uh, a youthful body, a healthy body, uh, and you could uh, bring your experiences, your knowledge uh, from your lived life, um, of course, the perspectives are uh, fascinating and frightening at the same time. Mm. Uh, because what are those bodies that you're going to, mm. to inhabit? Um, but yeah, the, like will they be stolen or sourced or, or grown in yeah. a lab Pre- or yeah, <clears throat> yeah, um, an artificial womb? I mean, there's so many options. And what is it that we are? If we could go back to the the, the idea of tombstones, what is it mm. that we are? That we go there to remember. We don't mm. go there to remember basically mm. the bodies. We go there to remember the persons, and mm. the persons are more about the personality, the mind, the uh, 
moods uh, of a person than whether their index finger looked like this or mm. their color of the hair mm. and, and so on. So um, so do we go there to remember the, the person or the body? Uh, mm. And and that is, that's never been of much consequence to think mm. about those things because yeah. you couldn't separate one thing from yeah, another. From the other. uh, but perhaps you can in the future. I know that uh, my husband always says, Sarah, your body is only a vessel you use to carry your brain to work. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. But I actually... I How dis- romantic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, but I actually I actually disagree with him quite a lot. Because, um, for example, I got in some trouble yesterday from for swearing on LinkedIn. And and I am not sure people would have had the same response to me if I was uh, older or if I was a man. No, so actually, I think that so much of our life, of our opinion, of our experience is shaped by our body yeah. and how the world responds to us and what we look like, yeah. where we are born. Yeah. Uh, and then also with altered carbon, I did prefer the first body to the second. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> the yeah. switch of actor was a little yeah. bit it was a little confusing. <laughs> Disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if um, your life has come to an end, maybe you uploaded your mind to the cloud, yeah. maybe you did it. Yeah. But um, but. If you are looking for an alternative of what to do with your body uh, once you have passed, the final story we brought with us uh, today is uh, about, uh, I guess, an alternative source of inspiration for what you can do. The article is from um, also from uh, Discover Magazine, actually. And um, it is about a, a startup that is allowing you to turn your body into a diamond. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit well, about that? I think it's it's such a poetic uh, story, actually, yeah. uh, that uh, you can take your ashes, your remains, and have them uh, integrated into a diamond because you can make artificial uh, diamonds, of mm-hmm. course, and you could have them um, integrated in this diamond and then put in a piece of jewelry, for instance, for mm-hmm. your uh, children or grandchildren or your wife or your spouse, at least. Uh, for them to wear forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's a, a really, really fascinating idea. Yeah. Uh, you really get in trouble. Like the other day I was washing my hands, I dropped my wedding ring oh, and yeah. it almost went in the sink. Okay. Imagine it's like, that's my grandmother. I just yeah, yeah, <laughs> took that, out in the good. toilet water, you know? That, that's that, not that, good. That, that, no. <laughs> that would yeah. be good. No. No, no, but I actually, so what you're saying is that we could convert our bodies into diamonds Yeah. and we could maybe eradicate the whole blood diamond industry at the same time. That would be beautiful, yeah. yeah. Um, it's like a wor- world peace. <laughs> yeah, 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 we can solve so many problems. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and with that, um, Christian, thank you so much for coming and helping us explore in this deep dive about the future of death and maybe afterlife, maybe immortality through technology. Um, I really appreciate all of your insights. And My to pleasure. all of you who want to know more about what Christian is doing and all these big tech companies, please go to student.canopylab.com and find our course on the future of death. Thank you.